a big welcome from here. And I am going to uh, torture you with a thousand PowerPoints. So um, I'll go to shared screen. If I talk to myself, I'll get this right. And here we go. Thumbs up, Kevin, They're coming across. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, thank you for that introduction. And also, thank you for some reason. They're not changing. Oh, here we go. Um, over here, um, we we acknowledge country, and, and there's a picture up there of um, uh, some of the traditional owners of this country. The gender balance isn't right, but it's uh, we start off with acknowledgement of country. Can I say that your acknowledgement of country, recognising stolen land, is so powerful that I'm incorporating it over here, that we are actually on occupied land and um, and uh we, there's no treaty in place um so and in doing that i often quote this guy the reverend jh style who was a, a moravian or high lutheran church mission manager of my people in lake Condor in 1872 he said that the educated blacks were much more trouble than the old blacks were and i get up every day to uh make sure that that is correct um that we are trouble and we won't go away and we're still here after all this time. Over here, we've got a, a legacy in history and education because originally uh, under the act, and the act was in place until I was 12 years of age in 1967, that uh, Aboriginal people weren't regarded as citizens of this land under a colonized government. And one of the detriments of it that was um, uh, we still have uh, reminders. Uh, we have in every town in this country, and we have a boundary road. And Aboriginal people weren't allowed to cross boundary road. It was an apartheid system in place. And uh, in 1967, uh, Aboriginal people were allowed for the first time to go beyond year eight, uh, early elementary, secondary education. Up until then, Aboriginal people were excluded from uh, uh, education. Uh, and so this is a, when we acknowledge elders, uh, this is a group of Aboriginal elders who around Laminex tables uh, in the 80s crafted, it's become uh, a revolution over here um, in Aboriginal education. I'm going to be a little indulgent because uh, when Aboriginal people transfer knowledge, uh, we do so through relationship. So rather than a transactional uh, talk, I want to uh, introduce you to uh, my genealogy, which is our way of transferring knowledge. And uh, the young woman appearing there with, uh, uh, it's my grandmother who uh, was on an Aboriginal mission and partaking in the social media of her day. Um, she's smiling, um, but uh, if you knew what happened to her uh, post years when her son, my father, was removed forcibly from, from her and never got to see her again. Uh, they died about a year apart from each other, living three kilometres away from each other, and they never got to see each other again. So one of the legacies is uh, that traumatic and the atrocities that were part of um colonialism in this country this is my non-indigenous side of the family they look like they stepped out of central casting for um for a a movie uh but i draw from both sides people ask me how come i don't kind of go to my white side of the family why i i i gravitate to my black side of the family and the reason is um no one's trying to take my white identity away from me, but everyone is trying to take my black identity away. This is a picture of my dad. Um, he's 17 years of age and he's standing on Framlingham Mission where he was removed at uh, six years of age. And he's looking pretty flash in that suit. He had just been released from the orphanage as a stolen kid. And uh, the words of the National Apology are coming up on the screen, but uh, talking to people who were away with him at the time as a young kid, and he was incarcerated in an orphanage, the same as the residents um, 
schools in Canada and, and the equivalent uh, in, in your country, uh, in the Americas or Turtle Island. Um, and he was beaten, used as a slave and sexually abused. And that's one of the things. As a result, I had an education that was removed. Um, I was in year eight when I, because of domestic violence, because of the demons that followed my father into his marriage, um, I, was, I grew up in, in homes, mainly Catholic homes, and uh, uh, had a bit of an institutional um, upbringing. These are some people from my heritage, and um, uh, excepting Alice personally, he's not um, my mob, unfortunately. Um, but uh, he's sparring up there with my first cousin, Lionel Rose, who was the bantamweight champion of the world and a real icon in this country. So, uh, and there's some other pictures. That's a picture of my career in a, a, on a page, um, running the Aboriginal school. Most of my career was working around, I've, I've got an assistant here who's helping me out and doing a great job. Um, down the bottom, most of my career was teaching in Asia. I'd rather teach in people with people uh, in cultural settings. And I will talk about a bit, uh, an epiphany I had doing it. But the picture of me on the Great Wall of China is one I often uh, tell the story about. And we, we are prolific storytellers. Um, so, Kevin, watch the watch. If I go too long, just pull me up, all right? But... Um, a little bit after when that picture was taken, that class, I was teaching business in China, where I realized that the Chinese are the best business people in the world and how insulting it was to, to go there and teach them Western. So my colleagues would, would there and tell the Chinese to say, this is how you do it. I would go in as an international uh, educator and say, you, you people, you are the best business people in the world. We learn more from you than I can teach to you. But if you want to know how the West thinks, listen to what I cover. And that changed the whole nuance. But on that occasion, the class took myself and my teaching team out for a meal. And we toasted each other's health and toasted each other's family's health. And it got a bit ridiculous. Toasted each other's pet's health. And then they said, we've got a, a surprise for you, a cultural statement. And they brought in a baby snake. And they snipped the head and bled the blood into a, a, a glass and gave it to me to drink. And I think, oh, my God, how do I handle this? Um, and I go, yep, culture. And I said to them, I, um, I'm really touched by this gesture. And I've shared with you my Indigenous heritage. But you will understand when I tell you this that I can't drink the blood because the snake is my totem. It's actually not. My totem is a black cockatoo with a red tail. I lied. And I said, I can't possibly drink it because of cultural reasons, but my non-Indigenous colleagues will drink it on my behalf. So um, I guess I use culture um, uh, productively. This is my international teaching career. Uh, the Power University in China, in Beijing, uh, Hong Kong Management Association, uh, Malaysian Institute of Management, um, Singapore Institute of Management and uh, Ateneo University in Manila, Philippines and uh, in Jakarta. So, um, and this is a picture of me being invited in to hear the national apology. And that's a former prime minister uh, who welcomed each of us in. And, um, and, and Kevin mentioned that I co-chaired the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, of which things I saw still keep me awake at night because of lack of equitable education. Um, our community's got our own proportional rate of bad dudes that need to be locked up. So I, you know, I don't shy away from that. But we are overrepresented. In, in fact, it's more likely that an Aboriginal kid in this country ends up in jail than ends up in university. 17 times more likely. And, and so after I did the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, where I read uh, in a period of my review, 10 coroner's reports graphically depicting uh, the, the death of 10 Aboriginal people who, because they were poor and because they were Aboriginal, ended up in jail. 
I dedicated the report to the men, women and kids who find the surrealism of the criminal justice system more attractive than the realism of their own life. Um, and um, I, I guess what I've done to, I was going to go and work in, in, the, in the legal system and the elders told me, no, stay in education. If anything's going to turn, uh, education will. And, and so um, I just, to give a bit of context to all the people online, <clears throat> uh, there is a group of countries who have a previous colonial heritage called, uh, and the acronym, and you give everything important an acronym, uh, Kansas, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the US. And uh, in those in those countries where British colonialism an animated, there was what I call the 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 four Ds. The, there was no creativity in their colonialism. It was to dis disrupt social, uh, dismantle language, disturb life, and diminish enterprise. And the um, the effect lives on. From Turtle Island, this is a quote from. Uh, Francis Harper that I found, which sums up where international education is at the moment. And a lot of indigenous uh, people of color, uh, marginalized people. Um, she said, a former slave um, and emancipated, we're all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. And you can't, and society cannot trample on its weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving a curse upon its own soul. So that curse in my country here is the fact by pretending we didn't exist, pretending that this land was uh, terra nullis, by pretending um, that we would die out, it means that non-Indigenous people have been cut off from the cultural heritage of the land that they live on. I often put up a sign, dispossession, and I get an eye, uh, a cumulative eye roll by the audience say, he's going to go on about Aboriginal dispossession, but in fact, I go on about um, uh, non-Indigenous dispossession, that the curse, as Francis Harper uh, suggests, is the fact that uh, colonialism is like a snake that bites itself. He comes back to suffer from it. In my university, we're trying to overcome that um, dispossession with a graduate out, uh, outcome number eight, or GLOW8, we call it. Uh, and it's about um, uh, global citizenship through an uh, Indigenous perspective. And where we've gone through that is in the by path of cultural intelligence. We started off with cultural awareness, which was like a cultural Kentucky tour, which people love at the time, but at the end, of it, they can't remember what happened and, and don't apply it. Then we went for cultural competency where, and we borrowed that from uh, Canada and um, from the health uh, area where we, we thought that we would want people to become competent in the area of understanding culture. But I've taken it to another level of cultural intelligence. So like when I worked in all those countries in, in Asia, I learned a lot about the Asian culture uh, not enough to, to navigate across a Chinese menu in a restaurant, but I learned enough about Guanxi and the other philosophies that would uh, impart on my teaching, my pedagogy um, and um, uh, style. And so cultural intelligence is the ability to read and translate cultural cues beyond personal tacit assumption. So it means you've got to get in and break the tacit assumptions that you have into productive workplace and community applications. So um, in that, uh, we borrowed heavily from David Kolb's model. We get the participants to have a concrete experience. We take them on country. We do ceremony with our non-Indigenous colleagues on country. Uh, we get them to reflect, come up with ways in which they can apply that in the curriculum and experiment, and that's a single loop, then we get them to go through to double and triple loop learning. So, um, but what it has to get to is a tacit assumption. So to change people's paradigms, you've got to tear away 
and, and get to the tacit assumptions that people uh, grow up. There's a book over here by an Aboriginal woman called Snake Cradle, and it talks about how uh, that non-Indigenous um, parent walking with their non-Indigenous child will walk past uh, a Black person here and squeeze the kid's hand, sending subliminal messages that there's something to be fear of. It goes back to the whole Black Lives Matter and that, but uh, why we can protest and advocate, the real change comes when in the paradigm shift where we can get into the, the tacit assumptions, where we can disrupt the, the status quo and see a new paradigm, um, which I hope I, like sometimes I get these pictures in the middle of the night and they got greater meaning in the middle of the night. But I also came across a book I haven't read yet, but um, I like the title. It's How to Lose Friends and Influence uh, White People. So uh, uh, it, 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 it's something that is at the core of, of what we do. But if I can give you an example, um, around the time that Pearl Harbor was bombed, that instigated uh, the American entree into World War II, uh, a remote capital city here in Australia called Darwin was also bombed. Now there is an Aboriginal man called Brian Butler who had just been stolen from his family, taken to Darwin, and he was in an orphanage like my father was in and being terrible things. The Japanese bombed Darwin and he was sent back to his family. And his word to this day is thank God for the Japanese. So in the history books, in the curriculum in this country, the tacit assumption that the Japanese were the enemies, um, a colonial expansionist regime that uh, attacked this uh, freedom loving country. But in fact, this freedom loving country was uh, employing the same breaches of human rights. And for Brian Butler, he was caught between two colonial expansionist forces and one happened to be Japanese. So that's what I'm saying with truth telling and with curriculum, if we can view things and in my argument with the education minister all last year about the national curriculum, um, he prosecuted the argument that it would make kids hate the country. And I don't think truth will ever, and I said he underestimated the youth and the intelligence and the spirit of this of this country, we will, we will all want a better place, but we won't get it by by mythology and hiding under the bed sheets. We've got to come out and expose those atrocities and put in place uh, action through education to make sure it never happens again. Um, here are a couple statements from the Cool and Gather statement. It's a, what I refer to as the Magna Carta of Indigenous Education. I don't know why to God I refer to the English document as uh, being important, but um, uh, 3.2, Indigenous people have the right to be Indigenous and cannot exist as images or reflections of a non-Indigenous society. So this first statement challenges us to work through curriculum. Um, and we know in all around the world, um, uh, you know, we are no longer prepared to take the, the back seat on the bus. This is a, a bit of the context of my dad. Uh, here is a, a guy who is a year older than me, uh, a stolen kid. I was removed, but not stolen. He was uh, stolen. And here's his police record from my state. And at the age of two years, six months, about the same age of my granddaughter right next to me here, he had a police record. And that police record was because he was removed. And with that, he's gone through life carrying a police record uh, around. So there's so much work we have to uh, give. Here's a list, some of the Black Lives Matter um, here in Australia, the, the deaths in custody. Um, just, uh, so when I'm working with non-Indigenous uh, academic colleagues, you know, there's the basic 
facts around Aboriginal Australia have been denied them because of that snake biting itself, because of that curse that uh, that was explained. So this is a map of Aboriginal Australia pre-colonisation. And can I say, um, with respect, uh, Kevin, to your country over there, where you pre recently had a president who wanted to put up walls at the border, um, and I won't get political if I haven't already. Um, in Aboriginal philosophy, the border wasn't the boundary. It was a common ground where you go to share knowledge with respect. So you go to the border to learn. You don't go to the border to escape or, or, or change. The border and, and in Aboriginal perspectives in curriculum, that's what I tell uh, all participants that they must do. They need to go to the border, the edge of their paradigm, the edge of their sensibilities to find the knowledge that they're seeking. And we believe that we're uh, embroidering, enhancing, augmenting the curriculum, not being, um, how can I put it, uh, pandering to a minority or placating uh, political correctness. So um, the other reality about Aboriginal Australia here, if you give each, look at your watch and give each minute a thousand years, Aboriginal people and the knowledge has been here the full hour. Aristotle, Socrates was here one minute, three seconds ago. So if you put Aboriginal wisdom, in fact, we didn't, we had to record our information in caves and painting. We didn't have a printing press, kind of challenge it. But um, the image of the Aboriginal person um, uh, is often stereotyped. Um, and and I've, I've got to declare that uh, on that picture there, I'm talking about the Aboriginal person, not her late uh, majesty. Um, uh, that there is stereotypes that, you know, an image that is projected in the curriculum the Aboriginal people are in the desert, they wear no clothes and they wander around. Well, where my nation is, it's a, a very cold place. If you walked around with no clothes on, you'd know it. Um, and we've fallen victim to uh, stereotypes, the same as Native Americans, the same of all people in colour, and we have to fight it. We believe the stereotype in this country that most Aboriginal people live in the desert, in the far north, uh, in remote, but most Aboriginal people are actually urban dwellers in the western suburbs of Sydney. And there is also a great divide that the colonisers went, followed the dollar, the economic imperative. And my country, because it was uh, like England, green and rich, they followed pastoralism for the first hundred years and they hit us and massacred us and incarcerated us. And then a hundred years later, they went followed the mineral and uh and that ha has led to a stereotype that the, that the aborigines in the north of this country have their culture and we don't well culture evolves and i believe i'm a traditional man and i live with traditional values even though i um don't fit stereotypes and, and of course Everyone on this call would recognize that racism is, is taught. And I picked this image up and you, you people online have probably come across it before. Of course, it's uh, the Lone Ranger who is wearing a very tight bodysuit and a mask. And if I wore like her, I would opt for a mask too. And he's standing in front of an indigenous character with a um, Spanish name and uh, the Lone Ranger's sidekick. Uh, is Tonto. Tonto would refer to the Lone Ranger as Kimosavi or Wise One, and the Lone Ranger would refer to Tonto uh, by his name Tonto, which in Spanish means dim-witted dim or stupid. So subliminal messages pervade our, the broader uh, dominant culture that reinforces uh, stereotypes. And um, I'm I'm trying to think why I put that picture in, but it, I, as I said, I get them in the middle of the night and sometimes, but I think I wanted to reflect how compartmentalised Western knowledge is. Uh, keep everyone happy and stay silent on hegemony. 
And of course, uh, the fact that what my people are feeling, uh, our colonial masters uh, had chains around our neck. And one of the downstream effects of colonialism uh, in neo-colonialism, we uh, we often put chains around our own neck, Ed. and and the the final act of colonialism is people who have been colonised turning into the colonisers. So what we need to do is break uh, change. These are a couple of quotes, Kevin. Rather than me talk through them, because I'd like to open up for questions, and I, um, but these are some of the leaders in this country. We've seen the rise, and Alan, you would have seen it. You've worked with. Uh, champions of it, the rise of the Black Academy. This is one, this is uh, Lester Irvina Rigdy, who talks about um, intellectual dollars. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, this continent was referred to as terra dollars, land with no people in it. Uh, um, this is Roger Grabon. I'll send these quotes about how Aboriginal people have rise. Uh, this is the very glamorous Anita Heiss, who we have now mastered the same language that was once used against us, describing us as barbaric and savage. We have empowered ourselves to tell our stories in our styles and in our for our people. And I'll, I'll send these along. And a typology of Indigenous knowledge that I put out there is there's five scales coming moving from perspective to uh, uh, integration of Western and uh, Indigenous knowledge here. Uh, there's still a typology of oppositional knowledge uh, where we contest and combat Western knowledge and, of course, contemporary knowledge and pure in Indigenous knowledge. So um, this is a quote that I wrote about Indigenous knowledge. Uh, if I could go back. Um, <laughs> Indigenous knowledge is on, on the present. It can be eagles soaring or feet beating uh, the desert in serenity. A class in algebra and trigonometry or rich stories drawn in the sand can be exchanging knowledges uh, and images with respect or messages racing through the ether. Ancient cures for modern diseases, indigenous knowledge and, and education is as simple as it is complex. And what we are trying to work for is a reconciled Australia, but it means that we work walk in both worlds. Uh, it can be a bit of a tightrope, but we want to make sure that our people, because of getting a Western education, aren't puppets. Um, we don't surrender our values. And at while at times, it's not, it doesn't have to be a tug of war. It's about going to the boundary and being brave and stepping over it and challenging non-Indigenous people to come to the same boundary and step over it because that's where uh, it is. It's a bit of a dial, um, but it, it's predicated who we are and what we bring to the, and we bring a great humanity. Um, a humanity, we say we draw from the world's oldest gene pool. It's uh, because of, we work at the sharp end of everything our emotional intelligence is, is so very high. We, as Indigenous people, through our knowledge, we see patterns in chaos a lot more easier than a Western education system that compartmentalizes knowledge. And, and, um, and uh, we see big picture and small picture. And so Indigenous knowledge in the curriculum in Australia and internationally brings the best of both worlds that we refuse to be the black handbag or the black cladding. Um, and that was a cheap ad for a conference that's just gone, the World Indigenous Conference. Um, uh, so, um, but here in Australia, my argument in Indigenous perspectives in the curriculum, and it can be taken internationally, it's not about political correctness, and it's not about placating a minority. It's about drawing on the true faces of this nation. Here in Australia, I prosecute, we have four faces. We have a colonial history that should be part of the curriculum. It's rich, and it, but at the moment it is, you know, it's more than Pareto, it's 90% of the curriculum. 
we we have a face that says we geographically are part of Asia and part of the Pacific, and that should be in the curriculum. We live here on this country <clears throat> in the world's most diverse multicultural community. That should be part of the country, uh, the curriculum. And we we have the we house the world's oldest living continuous culture. And I argue that we need a balance in the curriculum, in not only in knowledge, don't put us on the margin, on the fringe of uh, art and hip history, but indigenous maths, indigenous science. And um, by balance, uh, we will truly represent and, and prosecute national maturity. Um, but as I said, the former Minister for Education, who had his own issues, uh, clearly said that, that the work I was doing was dumbing down the curriculum and making kids hate the country. Um, I want and, and they kids do not know the atrocities that have gone on in the past. And we really need to make sure that they do know it. Um, sure, honey. Uh, we, we really need to know that they, they do know it and, um, and uh, we never go there back again. So um, I'm going to throw open to questions and stop the share so I can see everyone's faces, those who are willing to share their faces. And I, some, look at a lot of people there, Ariella. So um, I might throw open to, oh, that was a bit quick, but um, throw open to, to questions. It might have been quick, but it was powerful. I feel like a, 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 just a student over here <laughs> taking yes. notes in the chat and everything else. But we'll open up to questions. You all hop in here. Um, I'll check the chat. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for for your talk. Uh, like you said, all right, well, I feel very safe with, with this mob here. So thank you. So any questions you all have, just you can hop in here. You can raise your hand or just hop in. I look in the chat. Go ahead, um, Marianne. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you, um, Mark, for being here. Really powerful conversation. And um, I'm actually writing curriculum for an international school, and we're trying to have a balanced curriculum and share like stories of the global majority. My issue is it's really hard to find those stories and um, to find that content that's not from the Western perspective, to find the knowledge um, so that I can, as a curriculum designer, translate it. Uh, so I just wonder if you have any suggestions or resources or ideas. Uh, thank you for the question. And I'm being uh... I'm losing my earphone. Uh, Marianne, thank you for that question, and, and that's great. Here in Australia, um, we have seen, as I said, from 1967, we've been allowed to go uh, into schools and and the Black Academy has risen, and with it, a whole lot of writing, but it, it's there at the local level in, in, in communities. So we make it, uh, we do as much as we can to, um, to link, uh, in my university at the moment, I've my strategy was approved yesterday and it linked all disciplines into Aboriginal organisations of the same. So it's just making that path. But um, the stories, I, I presume, uh, where you are would be there, but um, it, it's just making the right connections. And, uh, yeah. So if anyone wants to babysit too. Thank you. <laughs> I hope they helped, Marianne. Um, yeah, I, we're, Thank you, we're but do you so find unique. that, well, so this is um, for an international school in Italy, um, oh, wow. but I, I do have a project thinking about how to develop a, you know, a humanities curriculum. Well, I think it's just this huge gap. Every, you know, every school that I've taught in over the past 20 years, is just yeah, yeah. huge gap. And then I can't, you know, between like the core, not, I mean, this is K-12 as well, also it's a little bit different, but you know, like yeah. a knowledge-based, content-based curriculum that honors um, the global majority. So, yeah, but, we, yeah, we, I'll have to get in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, look, um, get in touch with me. Um, I do a bit of work with uh, Reggio Emilio, which is a great education philosophy over there for early childhood, but really applicable uh, beyond that. Um, I might be contacting Reggio uh, after this uh, uh, <laughs> um, talk. But um, Marianne, what we say uh, when we work with our um, uh, academics is that 
in the absence, you know, particularly in the sciences, it's really hard to find, you know, suitable curriculum material. So it's the Aboriginal or Indigenous influence can come across by A, uh, curriculum, but B, pedagogy, where we move to relational education. Like I started telling you my story at the start, uh, I can't do transactional education. You know, the West is you ask a question, you get an answer, which is really exciting. Um, but uh, in our, you immerse in the, in, in the story. And the third way, Marianne, is student experience. And, uh, and in, in Italy, having that great philosophy or regio um, would be a good source. So, yeah, good luck with it. Contact me if you, you know, you. want to run ideas past. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Thank you so much, Mark, um, um, for being here. Uh, it's just it's just powerful that you're here and talking. Oh, thank you. That's really kind of you. Thank you. Because it's it's a perspective that we you know we just rarely hear. And and I, I guess my, my question is: um, many years ago, I had a white Australian friend. So um, I live in Perth usually, although I'm in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, you know, she's always saying things that are anti-racist and has a brown islander husband and so on. But one day she said something about how, you know, why do Aboriginals who look white are still going on and on about um, Aboriginal culture, especially when they've been, uh, and and I didn't quite know what to say to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was wondering what what would you say to that? So your friend was saying that why do we still go on? Yeah, especially it's, those who we, look white. You know, why, why are they still going on and on about um, yeah. racism, all of that, um, and also, you yeah, know, indigenous culture when they've been, you know, it's not part of their everyday life, or you know, some something like that. Yeah. It was years ago, so I don't quite remember exactly. No, no, no. I remember it, being it, very angry and not knowing what to say. Yeah, yeah. I look. Um, I've, I've been asked that question before and, you know, uh, you know how I, I co-chaired the Royal Commission and I was in every prison um, in, in, the, um, in the state. And I remember one night I went in and it was a former student of mine who tried to hang himself with his T-shirt uh, and, the, and the complexion or his, uh, you know, when you hug a kid who who sees all hope gone, that's when you, we we've we've got to fight. Plus, it's nation building too. It it's changing the paradigm. That um, I, I get really upset with uh, people. So who take my earplug out? No, um, I I get upset with people who who tell me that um my people must be proud of me because I've done so well. And, you know, I, I live like a, you know, a white person. And the reality is I'm really proud of some of my cousins who live in the park and they get up every day with an optimism that I, you know, with little hope in the day. And that takes real guts. I've been lucky. My ancestors have led me down the path. But I have an intention of remove, uh, returning us to a sovereign position in this country that we have to invade. I, I grew up in the protest era. I've been on marches and been locked up in police vans and, and the whole lot. But now I'm telling the young people, our weapons are data and narrative. And um, we have to fight in, a, in another way. Uh, I want us to have be returned to a sovereign position, not one that excludes people who have made their way here, uh, refugees, et cetera. But it, it, we, we, we have to fulfill the mandate of our ancestors and yeah. And, and we're fighters too. You saw my cousin with Elvis Presley before, yeah. Great question, I thank you for that. Thank you. May I ask another one? <laughs> yes, sure, Dan. Just to follow up on when you said um, sovereign position, uh, would you mind elaborating what that means? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we there are a group of my community who are fighting for sovereignty, and to we've never had a treaty 
if you look at the colonial output, um, there were a range of treaties in in the Americas uh, that were there and they were broken up and, and there's history there. They came to uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa, and had a treaty there and they came here and they go, no more treaties. It's uh, So we have never... Um, we have we have never ceded this land and so it's i we've got an election coming up and i was walking to work the other day and a politician handed me a how to vote card and i said i don't vote and he said how un-australian is that and i go well yeah you're a government of occupation until you realize that and enter it in to some sort of formal relationship you know i'm, I'm not going to vote i'll I'll pay the $50 fine. I, I said, I have a passport. It helps me get to the Qantas lounge quicker. That's the value of it. But I am an indigenous person and I maintain I haven't given up sovereignty and my grandkids haven't either. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a political, but it's a practical level because uh, the world's oldest continuous culture can't become an artifact. It has to uh be maintained and we believe that the western way of doing things is not the perfect way you know it's um a very average way yeah thank you pleasure If you don't ask a question, I'll just go back to my slides again and, and death by a thousand PowerPoint. Alan. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with one, Mark. I think, um, again, thank you so much for this talk. It was really wonderful. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, like for, for me living in Australia at the moment, it's it's really e easy to, to see this stuff um, every day and really come to life. And it's in so much of what we do. Um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, back my time when I was working in international schools and my international colleagues when um, you know we're trying to like there's a, a bit of a tension there about um, meeting external curriculum and, and benchmarks and a lot of you know just like we have in Australia with the national curriculum and the Victorian curriculum that mm -hmm. teachers have to meet you know a lot of these teachers work in IB schools or um, you know they're they're uh -huh. meeting some sort of external curriculum I'm wondering if you have any guidelines or suggestions about you know how you you know you honor that and you um uh, you know, help students meet the sort of external benchmarks that they have to and, you know, do this um, external curriculum stuff while also incorporating these perspectives and stories in an authentic way, not just sort of tacking mm. them on at the end as they can be or sort of, you know, doing them in a really sort of tokenistic way. But any sort of, and maybe just in generalities about like, how do you weave them in or embed them to make sure they're not just separate or not just, yeah, um, yeah. you know, a, a little thing that, you know, you do at the end or you do in one lesson and then you don't have to talk about again or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the last thing we wanted to become a token gesture, but we also want the best of both worlds, as I put up before. We want uh, all the sciences, all the linguistics, all the numeracy for all kids to be elevated and you know, uh, and by that type typology, there's stuff that fits more deeply in some curriculum areas. Um, but it's, it's where we're calling on the acumen of the um, teaching profession to develop uh, ways in which they can uh, embrace it. And it starts with those tested assumptions. It's what you give attention for. There was a school not far from here where the school received an Aboriginal flag and they put the flag up. And as the principal was tying the Aboriginal flag up to fly with the, the Australian flag, a little kid came up and said, that's my flag. And no one in the school knew he was Indigenous. So uh, it's everyone has got the right to be visible and heard in the curriculum. And, uh, you know, and... Um, you know, we 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 are geographically part of Asia, but it's another area in our curriculum that's lacking. You know, we 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 think the world started in you know 1788, and it Australia didn't start then, or we didn't end then. It, it's uh, it's uh, a story, and what we're trying to do is be a bit of uh, um, you know uh, architects of society, not in a 
negative way, but uh, create, uh, move to that nation setting uh, position. Um, yeah, so it, it's, um, yeah, I hope that answers, Alan. And Greg's asked a question in the chat, in the time teaching advocating for Indigenous, but have you come across a barrier of local majority culture not wanting to implement changes in the school? Um, Greg, here in Australia, uh, education architecture is different from uh, in the United States where we, where you've got districts and uh, we have a national authority, which I chair the Indigenous Committee for, that sets the Australian curriculum and it comes down, cascades to states. And that state curriculum uh, is the same for that whole state. So it varies. Sometimes they do a better job, sometimes a worse job. But uh, the barriers aren't at local level. They are... Um, the, the biggest barrier is within the, the paradigm of the educator. So, yeah, um, but yeah, huge, uh, huge barriers. There's, you know, something I didn't touch on, institutional racism uh, that e it exists, yeah. So I think if there's no other questions, can I, Kevin, can I thank you for this opportunity? I really have, uh, and Ariella has appreciated too. You're going to say hello to people, Ariella? You're going to wave to people? Bye. Bye. <laughs> God. So, um, Kevin, thank, and uh, Alan, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really interested in your group and I'd love to, to um, you know. Um, come back. <laughs> yeah, come back any any time. Um, uh, we say here, um, although I'm, there's an Aboriginal comedian who reckons I'm the only Aboriginal in the state, in, in the country that looks like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> it's a good thing he's a very close friend of mine, or I get very upset about that. But uh, I mentioned, I was talking, you know, uh, education leaders of, of colour, and uh, a, a colleague, an Aboriginal colleague said, they'll see you, you're not of colour. And said, but the moment you open your mouth, they'll know that you're of colour. So, yeah. So, look, I've really enjoyed it. Kevin, keep me in the loop and, and Alan, and uh, thank you for giving up your evening um, or your morning or, or wherever you are. And, and look, everyone's waving. Thank you so much. Thank you. No so worries. Much. Travel safe, everyone. You too. We so appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, okay. Alan. Thanks, Danau. Thanks, everyone. Introductions that everyone did. Yeah, say goodbye. Oh, you said goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank Here you. Bye.